Hi everyone, my name is Alex Claire Young and I'm a transmasculine non-binary person, a URC minister and a doctoral researcher. I currently spend a lot of my time exploring the experiences and theological understandings of and offering support to trans and non-binary people. I also volunteer as co-chair of the Open Table Network and as a member of the Creating Sanctuary core group. Creating Sanctuary is a pastoral care and safeguarding resource. The core team explains that we pray that through using this resource, our churches will understand more deeply what behaviours and approaches to people from the LGBT community communicate care and welcome, and those which cause harm. The aim is to love our neighbours and learn how we best show that. In this presentation, I will explain why trans safeguarding is necessary, why this is troubling, and how churches might do better at not only including, but also protecting trans people. I will refer to my PhD thesis, which will be available to read next year, my own personal experiences, and the Creating Sanctuary Trans Safeguarding in Practice resource, which is available online. Why is trans safeguarding necessary? When I took part in an ecclesial project by, in part, telling my story with Jo, my wife, on film, my personal safety was impacted by a member of the church and the Christian charity that he works for. He released a video which misgendered us, questioned our fitness to minister, described us as evil, and suggested that church members should have nothing to do with us. This led to credible threats to our safety and even our lives. This was not the first time that I have been at risk in church. When I was a teenager, a church trip abroad, which lasted for one month, was used by youth leaders as an opportunity to attempt to convert my sexuality to heterosexual. This left me with severe anxiety, severely impacting my young adult years. I still struggle with anxiety to this day. I've experienced microaggressions, small incidents that build up to cause real harm in every church that I have ever attended. I'm not alone in my experiences. There are no major studies regarding trans experiences in UK churches. This is a striking gap. In my PhD research, though, I interviewed 10 trans and non-binary people with very diverse identities and experiences of church. Nine out of 10 had experienced trauma related to church. The one participant who hadn't experienced church-related trauma explained that they avoided church for several decades and chose to only attend LGBTQ plus specific churches on their return to faith. The participants experienced trauma including mispronouning and misgendering, attempted conversion abuse, the reinforcement of gendered norms, forced de-churching, physical, sexual and emotional abuse. In addition, financial abuse was a common experience amongst several participants, with participants being made homeless or jobless unexpectedly due to a church's reactions to their identity or transition, and with financial penalties being used to persuade church members to adhere to expected norms. Sadly, these experiences are not surprising, given that every book or article written by or about a trans Christian includes accounts of church-related trauma and abuse. In other words, it's pretty risky to be trans in church. Despite this, no UK church denominations provide trans-specific or even LGBTQ plus specific safeguarding guidance, policy or training. The idea of equality, that we should treat everyone the same, has been misused to suggest that the risks that trans people face in church are the same as the risks faced by any other person, despite the evidence provided by trans people's personal experiences. A more helpful model than equality is equity, which, in the case of safeguarding, would recognise that each person requires bespoke protections, bearing in mind their own identity, gifts, vulnerabilities, experiences, needs and insights. Moreover, trans people and non-binary people are made especially vulnerable in churches by the theological misunderstanding that humans must be male or female in accordance with sex. This theological error is foundational to the denial of trans and non-binary people's inherent personhood and value to this day. When I reported the harm done to me by a church member to the relevant safeguarding team, 
it was explained to me that a report could not be made because LGBTQ plus people were not considered to be a safeguarding category in the denomination concerned. This meant that I had no support in my subsequent need to report the incident to the police, which I had to do given the credible threats that I was experiencing to my safety and the safety of those around me. I have still received no support from the denomination concerned. The fake news that LGBTQ plus people are not relevant in safeguarding policy and practice leads me to my second question. Why is this troubling? I hope that you will agree with me that the accounts of harm mentioned above are inherently troubling given the sanctity of human lives and the duty of care that churches have for their members. I believe that the lack of understanding of the need for LGBTQ+, and particularly trans, specific safeguarding is concerning for more systemic reasons though. Firstly, it is based on an assumption that churches are exempt from the need to protect LGBTQ plus people from harm, which increases our level of vulnerability. Secondly, it ignores the fact that LGBTQ plus people, whilst not inherently vulnerable, are often adults at risk under UK law by way of our lived experiences and the ways in which we are treated in society and in the church. As such, the church has a mandated responsibility to safeguard us from harm. So how might churches do better? To highlight all of the ways in which churches might better safeguard LGBTQ plus people from harm would take significantly more time than available to me today. Further, the answer to the questions of how churches might do better is different in each case. If you would like support to improve the safeguarding of LGBTQ plus people in a particular church, please do get in touch with me or any member of the Creating Sanctuary team. There is time, however, to look at two key areas of trans safeguarding, gendered language and microaggressions. If you find this overview helpful, you can read more about this in the resource mentioned earlier. Our resource includes materials about language, coming out, transition, friends and family, abuse and microaggressions. Each section includes tips, questions, case studies and checklists of actions that you can take to improve the safety of trans people in your church or organisation. Gendered language. One of the foundational elements of trans and non-binary inclusion is the use of inclusive and expansive language. Safeguarding language. Formal language is often traditionally binary. You may be used to reading documents that include wordings such as she, he, it's increasingly important to ensure that safeguarding language includes people who are non-binary or avoids dividing people by gender. This might mean changing she slash he to they or using they slash she slash he. It is also important to understand the implications of binary policies. It's increasingly unhelpful to have a rule that separates men and women. It may be more helpful to focus on policies that can apply to all people, regardless of gender, reflecting the appropriate local and denominational safeguarding policies. It is also important to consider the use of gendered language in church more generally. Whilst this is not a safeguarding issue per se, the repeated and exclusive use of binary language can be microaggressive to trans people and over time may cause harm. In 1984, the United Reformed Church agreed to use inclusive language for people. In 2014, the URC built upon this and asked all congregations to use inclusive and expansive language and imagery in worship, both when referring to God and when referring to people. Despite this, local practice varies. This is just one example. Every Christian denomination is at a different point on the journey towards inclusive and expansive language. It is vital that as this topic is discussed, the effect on trans people is considered. Churches should remember that trans people, including non-binary people, are created in the image of God and that many people identify as neither or both male and or female. Church language should reflect this as much as possible in order to properly include trans and non-binary people and to limit microaggressions. Microaggressions. Microaggressions have been around throughout history but are only just beginning to be recognised in the fields of sociology, 
mental health, safeguarding and inclusion. Although the risk of high level abuse is known and must be taken seriously, trans people are also at risk of repeated incidents that in isolation appear to be small, but as they build up over time can have serious effects. It is vital that the safeguarding of trans and non-binary people includes mitigation against potential microaggressions. Binary language, activities and assumptions can all be microaggressive to trans people. Using varied language, keeping activities gender neutral or mixed gender wherever possible, and avoiding assumptions are important ways to mitigate against these microaggressions. Representative fatigue is the exhaustion caused by being continually asked questions about part of your identity or being regularly asked for advice about people who hold similar identities. Trans people can be expected to speak for all other people when, in reality, we are all individuals. Trans people can feel as though their transition is the only interesting part of themselves. Asking about other aspects of our lives and interests in conversation can be a helpful mitigation. It may also be helpful to invite a professional trans advocate or minister to lead training, which may minimise the amount of this work that a trans person has to undertake. Medicalisation happens when we assume that being trans is all about a series of clinical steps that are taken to solve a clinical problem. Whilst clinical support is helpful for some trans people, it is not the only aspect of trans identities. It is also not a universal part of trans experience. It's important to avoid asking trans people about personal medical information and to see being trans as an integral part of a person's identity rather than as a problem. Following the breadcrumbs of delight. There is a trope in media and popular culture of trans suffering. To fully explore trans safeguarding and keep trans people safe, it has been necessary to buy into that trope to some extent, to consider the ways in which trans people have suffered in churches and faith spaces. The reason we do this though is to make space for trans joy. One of my research participants describes his transition as a joy-filled journey towards euphoria rather than a retreat away from dysphoria. He explains that he is simply following the breadcrumbs of delight. I would like to encourage you to use the Creating Sanctuary Trans Safeguarding and Practice resource in your church or faith group to take trans safeguarding seriously and to make space for trans people to find some breadcrumbs of delight in spaces that welcome, love and care for us. Thank you.